I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics to today's lecture in our series on, uh, on end-of-life care. Um, next, next Wednesday, uh, in this room, ma March 11, Professor Nadia Sawicki uh, will be giving a talk on, uh, the title is, Tort Liability in End-of-Life Care. Uh, tort Liability in End-of-Life Care. A and that will be the last talk of the winter quarter. We then will resume uh, this series. Um, Tayon, do you know what date? Um, I think the first Wednesday in April, yeah. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dan Brauner. Dr. Brauner is an associate professor of medicine, the director of the Geriatrics Fellowship Program, and the medical director of Montgomery Place Healthcare Pavilion. Dan earned his MD from State University of New York at Syracuse, completed his residency at Cook County Hospital where he was chief resident. Dan then completed fellowship training at the University of Illinois at Chicago and at Cook County. Dr. Brauner's academic interests include interdisciplinary approaches to medical and ethical issues with a primary focus in geriatrics. Um, he has been interested in the effect of dementia in the care of other illnesses and in the ways in which linguistics can inform novel approaches to improve communication with patients who have dementia. Currently, Dan is developing a method for evaluating decision-making capacity in patients with dementia. Dan has also studied the history of cardiac arrest and CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, as well as our current practices of resuscitation. He published articles titled, Later Than Sooner, a proposal for ending the stigma of premature do not resuscitate orders. That appeared in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society in 2011. And another article entitled, Attending Code Status Discussions at Admission, which appeared in the Journal of General Medicine in 2011. And another article, in hospital CPR in the New England Journal in 2009. Today, we're looking forward to Dr. Brauner's talk. The title, title you see behind me, Welcome to the Cardiac Arrest Paradigm. Please join me giving a warm welcome to Dan Brauner. Okay, I wanna welcome you to the uh, cardiac arrest, it's still feeding back a little bit. Cardiac arrest paradigm, um, you can still hear me? Question is, Starting off with, what is a paradigm? How am I using it here? Uh, it's hard to express in just one word, so I have a bunch of meanings, um, which all apply. It's a model, core concepts, which is sort of Kuhn's uh, approach, a theory or a group of ideas about how something should be done, a way of looking at something, a typical example, a standard perspective, and a framework. So uh, what is the cardiac arrest paradigm? I hope to flesh out this concept during this talk. One definition um, that I'm going to give you up front is that it's the per pervasive application of aggressive therapies based on narrowly defined parameters frequently pertaining to a single organ system, whether or not they are expected to actually help the patient overall. And this happens disproportionately at the end of life in the paradigm. Cardiac arrest and CPR is the defining indication therapy combination of the paradigm. The paradigm came into existence coincident with the default application of CPR to everyone whose heart stopped in the 1960s. It then served as a model for the administration of other indication therapy combinations. I'm going to begin with an illustrative case in every person. It's an 88-year-old man who lives a fairly contented life in an assisted living facility because he has some mild cognitive impairment, which is very common at this age. Uh, he develops pneumonia, is hospitalized, and soon develops multi-organ system failure. He's then intubated for respiratory failure, 
He's put on dialysis for renal failure. He has a feeding tube inserted for failure to eat. Now, his family has consented at several points in the course of all these procedures. At those moments, they are given the choice to do everything or change their goals of care and become DNR. And they've decided to do everything with the hope that he'd get better. Now, this is a common scenario that plays out in hospitals across the country. And you can find p patients like this um, in our hospital now, as well as many in the city. It illustrates the onslaught of invasive organ-specific therapies applied in default fashion. It also, the case also illustrates the method for negotiating care in the paradigm. This requires patients and families to opt out of usual care. Our case, what's important though is our case does not represent a singular failure occurring suddenly at the end of life. It's just more obvious. The paradigm becomes much more obvious in patients who are dying. Care under the paradigm equals doing everything, whether or not it will help the patient. And we as physicians move in and out of the paradigm in our practice. Question is, what is everything? Everything was actually initially defined as performing CPR. But this quickly expanded to a panoply of options, of indications and therapy combinations. CPR set a template for, for care and then acted, um, it's, CPR set a standard for care and then acted as a template for other indication therapy combinations in the paradigm. How did it, um, a key to understanding the cardiac arrest paradigm is the, is, comes from the question, why did a therapy such as CPR, known to be ineffective in the vast majority of patients, especially those at the end of life, become the default for every patient whose heart stopped in the hospital? How did it happen? The usual explanation is, uh, for this is that CPR needs to be administered in a fire drill-like precision. And no one can think about it at that moment you need to apply it. But I think that it's much more complicated than that. And there is actually a constellation of forces that are at work here. Um, there's the momentum of the over 200 year history of resuscitation medicine and its evolving indications, which I will talk about. There's the nature of the treatment of death. There is a strong belief in the CPR project. There are strong economic and political forces that I will discuss as well. And also there's the way we, we the mechanisms that we developed in response to the default have become essential parts of the paradigm the way the care is negotiated. Cardiac arrest currently has three usages in modern, modern day parlance. The first one is as a ca cause of death. And here we have an obituary from the New York Times, happens to be of Claude Levy Strauss, um, who died at 100 peacefully, peacefully at home. And on this, in the second paragraph, we see his son Laurent commenting that he died of cardiac arrest. Secondly, it marks a moment of reversibility between the last heartbeat and the finality of death, based on the potential of a therapy, making it a most contingent condition. In the first use, to say that cardiac arrest is a cause of death is not so much to ascribe it a lethal causality, but rather to affirm it as a moment endowed with the potential to restore life, and thereby announcing a failure to do so highlighting, again, the contingent nature of this condition based on its potential therapy. The third usage marks a moment of struggle between the, fir between the first two, between those who wish to define the, mo the event of cardiac arrest as one of reversibility on the one hand, and those who wish to define it as one of finality on the other. In such cases, cardiac arrest becomes a point of contention, reflecting a battle of competing norms played out in ethics consults every day. <clears throat> I'm interested in the history of resuscitation medicine for the story it provides about its evolving indications. Looking at practitioners who were determining during, during this long history who should get the therapy and under what circumstances. 
I'll start with the first systematic movement um, to uh, treat drowning, that, which started in the 18th century, move on to the surgical movement, which uh, involved res um, responding to a side effect of anesthesia in the 19th and 20th centuries, and then the important move out of the operating room, which started in the mid-20th century, onto the default in the late 60s, and then circum circumventing the default in the 70s and on to today. So here we see the cover of the transactions of the Royal Humane Society, which was started in London back in 1774, a few years after the Amsterdam st um, Society started. On the facing page, we see their report of 1775, in which they um, claim that in 33 out of 67 cases, um, life was successfully restored to uh, drowning victims. And they t this, this was a very well, um, uh, they kept really good track of uh, who, they were, who they were doing this to. There was a reward system that I, I'm not going to get into today. Um, but it actually did work. Um, these are from dioramas, pictures of dioramas from resuscitation techniques. They were actually in the Museum of Science and Industry. This appeared later in, a, um, in the JAMA, um, in an issue uh, devoted to, um, to CPR. So you can see here some of these um, techniques were fairly aggressive. Um, others were more physiologic. Um, we see a man being rolled over a barrel, which is where that expression comes from. We see one galloping on the back of a horse. Um, and you can see, and here's a bellows, we can see that these techniques, um, some had some good physiologic bases. Um, part of the, what the Humane Society did was pr um, provide practitioners with equipment. Um, here we see a picture of uh, the bellows, which is really the first mechanical ven respirator, uh, ventilator, um, because this was primary of ventilatory death. Um, we also see a knife in which they uh, perform tracheostomies. Um, and so this was a fairly um, sophisticated um, way of resuscitating people at that time. And in fact, it did work. The important the, the important reason it did work was because instead of, they changed, the, 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 it was a misdiagnosis. These people were not dead. They were apparently dead. Um, and so that gave them that moment then to reverse that, um, to that situation. Here's just for um, pure interest, this is a tobacco resuscitator. So they, besides um, a, um, ventilating patients, they also um, gave them, heat was a big thing at the time uh, based on old ideas about the, the need for heat in the body. Um, but also, um, they used chemicals. And tobacco was one of the, uh, a stimulant back then. And this is a, a, a bellows that were actually used at the time to um, provide patients, um, drowning victims, with um, they would actually blow smoke up their rectums um, as part of the therapy. But what I'm really interested in, um, is how the, the physicians of the time, the practitioners of the time, thought about their therapy. And this is a, a really interesting letter. Um, it's a letter to Lord Car Cathcart, who was the president of what they called the Board of Police in Scotland. And he was trying to uh, develop a humane society in Scotland. And he asked Dr. William C Cullen, who was a well-known physician of the time, His Majesty's first physician at Edinburgh, to write a letter in support of, the, of starting a um, a um, humane society in Scotland. And the letter is, is interesting in that he describes uh, the indications uh, for resuscitation. Um, remember that a lot of the Fs are actually Ss in this. It must be acknowledged that there are cases in which from the destruction of the organization and perhaps from other circumstances, the recovery of drowned persons may not be possible. But as it is seldom that such cases can be certainly distinguished, so they are very seldom to be supposed. And although the drowned person have lain for several hours in the water, attempts should be made for, for their recovery. Even supposing the case very doubtful, the labor of many fruitless attempts is not to be put in competition with one instance of success, where a person is recovered who must have certainly died if great pains had not been taken for his recovery. We see here sort of the indication creep that is sort of natural to a, a therapy like uh, resuscitation, based on the uncertainty um, of whether or not it will work, and also the greatness of the reward, bringing back someone to life. And this is a recurrent theme we see in the history of resuscitation medicine. 
The next big um, movement in, uh, in resuscitation is in response to death from anesthesia. So in 1848, very quickly after they first started using chloroform, they saw that the chloroform could actually kill patients. This is uh, approximately the, the uh, incidence. The initial methods used uh, to treat these victims um, was very similar and obviously inspired by the humane societies. And there are a few case reports uh, in the literature, which I don't have time to go into, um, about um, using mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation and, and actually working at times, just like they had used in the humane societies. But very early on, they realized that this was not really a, mostly a ventilatory death. In some cases, it was because of just too much chloroform, but some people actually had, um, even if you gave them the right amount of chloroform, they had um, reactions, cardiac uh, reactions. And this is um, a quote from uh, Dr. John Snow, famous from his work on cholera, who, al who also was very interested in anesthesia and did a case series of people who had died um, from um, during surgery or being inducted by anesthesia. And he notes that in all cases in which the symptoms, um, in which the symptoms which occurred at the time of death are reported, there is every reason to conclude, as shown above, that death took place by cardiac syncope or arrest of the action of the heart. And we see here an early reference to this notion of cardiac arrest. It hadn't been really, it hadn't really come into the parlance yet. Now, the concept of cardiac arrest has been discussed in various terms since Harvey described the motion of the heart and blood in his treaties, uh, which you see here. Before cardiac arrest described, um, before cardiac arrest described all death, the term was used specifically to describe the stopping of heart that had two characteristics or terms that led up to the use of cardiac arrest. The first has to do with the suddenness of the event. So not everybody whose heart stopped was de de developing sudden death or cardiac arrest. So first it's the suddenness. And what the suddenness really um, applies to is the, if you're expecting it or not. Obviously, there is no difference. I mean, a heart's beating and then it stops beating. So it always stops suddenly, right? But it's, the suddenness of it really has to do with if you're expecting it to stop. The second characteristic is the present, presence of approximate cause. And dropsy at that time was described as one of the causes of cardiac arrest, or a term like cardiac arrest. So in response to this um, new indication, um, this man, Maurice Schiff, working in the 1970s, he's a German experimental physiologist, developed a, a radical surgical technique for the new indication. And he was working on uh, animals, and, and the technique basically involved opening up their chest and squeezing their heart and pumping the blood. And he was able to uh, use chloroform to, um, to, uh, um, to create um, a state in which their, their heart stopped, um, usually f after they stopped breathing, because he was giving them too much chloroform. But um, it also worked in patients who had primary cardiac, um, it could potentially work. And he was basically seeking a substantial remedy for paralysis of the circulation. Again, we don't see this term cardiac arrest, but, but paralysis of the circulation, which is referring to the same thing, occasioned by the use of chloroform, a fatality for which no reliable means of treatment have hereto been found. So this is 1874, Haik is describing what uh, Schiff is doing. Now, the first attempt on a patient in response um, to, to um, Morris's work um, occurred in 1880 by uh, the surgeon Paul Nihans, who was uh, doing an operation to remove a goiter. And um, the case is actually reported by his surgical assistant. Um, and he, he reports that he started doing artificial respiration, um, but after that didn't work, um, he uh, resected the ribs, laid bare the heart, and began rhythmic compressions. Um, the patient didn't live, and, and Nihans never reported the case. But once we had a successful um, surgical uh, treatment in the 1900s, he retrospectively, his, uh, his assistant said, we actually did this back in 1880, and he reported that in 1903. So that's the first case. By the turn of the century, there are actually several uh, cases uh, reported successes. And this is a classic uh, sort of style of how these papers um, are presented. This is uh, by a man named W.W. Keene, William Keene. Um, and he had one case which 
did not survive. But that didn't stop him from reporting about it. He, what, and this is a very common practice at the time, is he basically collected all the, the worldwide literature on, on cardiac arrest and resuscitate, surgical resuscitation at the time and reported all those cases. Um, and so this was, a, it turned out that there were 28 cases and four of them were successful in this paper. Um, and you can see um, the excitement and the, how this, this technique sort of captured people's imaginations. Um, this is, he presented the case at the Philadelphia County Medical Society. He, he presented that paper. Um, and that was then reported in the Philadelphia Public Ledger and then picked up in the New York Times um, this month in 1904. And this is a quote from Keene, life apparently is extinct has been renewed, or shall we say the dead themselves have been brought back to life. Um, so this is, was a technique that was practiced by, I would say, a very small band of uh, sort of um, you know, um, intrepid surgeons, shall we call them. Um, and the ones who actually report their cases, of course, you know, there are probably a lot of surgeons who are doing this without reporting it, and it's impossible for us to know about that. Um, but this, here's a case by Norbury who talks about cardiac uh, massage as a means of resuscitation, and he's been interested in uh, cardiac massage, and he, his, his term for the indication here is apparent sudden death. Um, and he talks about his cases here. But what, the thing that, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm interested here in um, sharing is how, number eight, how he talks about never give up on a case of apparent death under an anesthetic as hopeless until cardiac massage and its various accessories have been given a fair trial. So again, we see this notion of you have an indication, and you, get, you should do it on everybody um, in who that indication applies. Here we see um, an early use of the term cardiac arrest in, in the, um, um, the case of a young man who had been shot probably during World War I, a soldier, um, and who had chronic sinusitis who develops cardiac arrest um, and is actually brought back uh, for a while. Um, he doesn't survive, but for a couple of days they bring him back. Um, here's another case um, in going into the 1940s here. Sometimes they did an abdominal approach. This is a young man who obviously um, was, w survived the, the case. Um, and here they call it impending death under anesthesia. But we can see, this is a, a graph I made of the reported cases of open cardiac massage. Um, and we can see up until the 1940s, it was a pretty, um, at least the reported um, cases in the literature were pretty small. Um, the 1945 um, um, report was a, a historical. They reviewed all the world's literature, and they had 143 cases uh, that were done, and, that, and they reported actually a 33% success rate. But this was going to change. This changed dramatically in the 1950s, um, and we see an increasing number of patients receiving open cardiac massage in the operating room. But the other really important thing that happens in the 50s is that they move the procedure out of the operating room. Um, one of the reasons why the increased uptake of the, of the procedure was the development of this device. This is Claude Beck's uh, defibrillator that he built. And uh, as a picture I took of it in Cleveland at his archives. Um, it's, he uses, I love the switch on it. Um, anyway, uh, so he, um, he, de he was the first person to actually successfully defibrillate a heart in 1947, he used these two spoons um, and his internal uh, res um, defibrillation. So the chest is open and he, he's zapping it um, with those spoons. Those were the actual spoons. So Claude Beck, who's defibrillated, was, is a really important uh, character in the history of resuscitation. Um, he developed this manual, which was actually based on his course um, for open cardiac massage, which um, hundreds, actually thousands of surgeons from all over the world came and took this course to learn how to do open cardiac massage. Um, this first, the first uh, edition of this comes out in 54, and this is the second edition in 58. Um, it's, it says it's written by Hosler, but if you read, if I've read this, and it's all, it's all, um, it's all um, Beck's work. And this is, and his previous, quoting his previous writing, this is Beck in the middle there, he's sort of the, the, 
the wide guy in the middle. Um, and this is them, this is what the surgeons would come, and it was a weekend course, and they basically, part of the course was um, actually defibrillating, a, you know, doing open cardiac massage on dogs, um, and everybody who took the course would learn how to do that. And it was a way of showing them that it worked. Claude Beck was also interested in, in getting the word out. He was a real um, advocate for this procedure. And th this is from one of the movies he made, which was titled, the Qu This is the Choir of the Dead, uh, in which he gathered all the people that he had resuscitated in the operating room and interviewed them about their deaths and their uh, resurrections, actually. The other important player in the 50s uh, was Hugh Stevenson, who was actually a chief resident in surgery at the time at Bellevue Hospital in New York. And he, um, this is reported the largest case series to date, um, and which is actually, again, a worldwide registry, plus their experience at Bellevue. And he talks about it very openly about our definition of cardiac arrest as well as our indications for cardiac massage, which is closely tied, obviously, may have widened. And the reason they've widened is, is in part is because they developed what's probably the first mobile uh, cardiac resuscitation unit, which they use in the operating room, but they also use it um, on the wards. And basically, he gives a course very much in the style of Beck, in which he teaches the house staff at Bellevue how to do this procedure. And he lets them loose on the wards. And so um, they start doing open cardiac massage on people dying on the wards. It's really hard. It, 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 the, reading the paper, it's really difficult to tell um, who they do it on and who they don't. What we get. Um, is really just the location, because you know, location, location, location is really the key here in terms of um, defining um, cardiac arrest, because initially the only place you could have it was in the, uh, in the operating room. And so the important part here is that now in this series, there are 13% are occurring outside the operating room. And you can see they're happening all over the hospital. So once you're out of the operating room, the question is, who do you do resuscitation on? You know, which, which people who are dying? And, and it's not really discussed at all in the paper. Um, but they do report a fairly good success rate, which I'll get into. Another important thing that happens in the mid-50s, well, 1956, is, a, is a, another paper by Claude Beck um, reporting on the, the first man to have, do, to have um, suffered cardiac arrest, um, it looks like from a, a heart attack or an MI, who is successfully resuscitated. And it, it's, a, it's a case that he repeats over and over again in various places, including his manual. Uh, this is a doctor who's in his mid-60s who's just leaving the hospital and has the big one just as he's walked outside the hospital. And they grab him, bring him back in, crack his chest, defibrillate him, and actually save his life. Um, interestingly, Beck had advocated starting to do car open cardiac uh, massage um, outside the operating room in the late 30s um, in a paper. And he, he was pr pretty much alone in this. Um, and he actually, they talk about him doing this on the wards um, and performing open cardiac massage on the wards on people who are dying. But he never, he doesn't report any cases until this one in 56. So that's like many years later. So theoretically, he's probably there doing a lot of these cases um, without much success. But Beck had a, a really interesting vision, and this is a paper he wrote in 56 um, talking about the future of medicine. And you can see here um, there's a man on a golf course, which is the classic, you know, CPR, you know, doing CPR on the golf course. But you can see here that he's not doing, um, you know, closed chest compression. This, his, heart, his hands are in this guy's chest, and Claude Beck actually advocated that people, the lay people should be taught uh, open cardiac massage, very much like CPR is taught today, and that you, you should have the equipment um, you know, easily accessible on the golf course, et cetera, and that people could be saved because they had hearts that were too good to die, um, was, was the way he termed it. Anyway, um, later in the 50s, we see Stevenson, um, who's now moved to Missouri. He's, his, he's increased his number of cases. He now has 1,700 cases of, uh, of open cardiac massage and reports a 29% survival, which is really good considering that all these people would have died 
uh, if they had not had received the open cardiac massage. And most importantly, I think, he also reports 209 cases occurring outside the operating room. And he's reporting a survival rate in these patients of 21%, which is also very good, much higher than, than, um, than we get today. So, so then, um, this is actually my favorite paper from the, the, the whole um, surgical um, resuscitation movement. And it's a paper that um, was already um, outmoded when it was published and so really did not get a lot of uh, press because it's published, it's, a, it's, a, it's the um, case um, reports on open cardiac massage, but it's published two months after the first paper on closed chest compressions. So it was uh, a little late. Uh, coming to the party here, and so not a lot of people read it. But what it is, it's a very critical um, a view of, of open cardiac massage. So what they do, um, this is Stahlgren and Engelcheck, um, publishing in September of 1960. They, they report on their cases of open cardiac massage um, in the operating room, but also they report on their cases on the wards, inspired probably by Beck, and uh, Stevenson, uh, they say, well, we're going to try this as well. And so um, they do. And they report their outcomes. And they spend most of the time in the paper, although they only do uh, 25 cases on the wards, they spend most of the time on the paper talking about that experience because that's really the, the essential experience for them. They, they have a very respectable, you know, almost 25% success rate in the operating room, which is, means that they're, you know, they're doing the technique probably um, as well as, you know, was the standard of care then. But of the 25 people that they resuscitated outside the operating room, they only were able to bring back, well, as they say, salvaged one. And this was a patient who was uh, getting a bronchography. And bronchography is uh, basically a procedure where they uh, blow um, iodinated oil into your lungs to, so they can sort of outline the bronchioles when they take an x-ray. Um, and it, obviously, this guy probably had a reaction to that uh, and died uh, and suffered cardiac arrest and was brought back. Um, and part of their critique, which I think is really interesting and, and gets to one of the essential problems of the reporting on, um, on resuscitation is that when he looks at his cases, plus he's, he's, he did a review, he looked at the uh, other cases in the literature at the time, he finds that a physician has usually performed the study which precipitates the arrest. In other words, that these are iatrogenic or hospital cause um, deaths and that these are the people who are actually responding to resuscitation, although that's never mentioned in any of the other papers on the subject. Um, so this is the paper that sort of um, uh, supersedes their paper. It's published two months earlier in July of 1960. And this is the first uh, case of uh, the first case series of closed chest compressions um, published by Kuenhaven, Jude, and Knickerbocker. Um, and they, they talk about the triumph um, that you no, no longer need to do a thoracotomy, which is really a big deal, because a thoracotomy is really a messy um, and very sort of, um, 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 it's a very uh, sort of bloody procedure and very, you know, obviously traumatic. So it, this is a, a, an amazing, um, an amazing um, advance. And the apocryphal story, it, it could be true, is um, so Kuenhoven and Knickerbocker are both electrical engineers. Um, and uh, the story is that Knickerbocker was working on creating an uh, external defibrillator, which had Paul Zoll in the 50s showed that you didn't have to crack the chest to defibrillate. You could actually defibrillate from the surface. Um, and they had a Knickerbocker and Kuenhoven, well, Kuenhoven had the grant from GE, uh, General Electric, um, and because they wanted a portable defibrillator because so many of the linemen were dying um, from getting shocked um, at the time. The electricity had, was, was still, um, they hadn't really worked out a lot of the safety uh, issues with it. Um, and so uh, Kuhn, uh, Knickerbocker, was, who was his assistant, uh, was working on creating the defibrillator. And the story goes that they were experimenting on dogs, and the dog was hooked up for, uh, with pressure monitors um, because they couldn't use an EKG machine because when you shock them, the whole thing goes, you know, kablooey. Um, so they, had it, they, they monitored the heartbeat by looking at the changes in pressure. And the story is he put the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, 
the lead, um, the defibrillator paddle, on the, on the dog's chest. And when he put it on the chest, he saw a blip in the pressure. Um, and, he, and, it, and he started pushing, and he saw that you could increase the pressure um, just by pushing down on the chest. And that, that was the beginning of uh, closed chest compressions. Um, now, what's really interesting about this case series is that they report a 70% uh, success rate in their first 20 patients. Um, and this is a, a really, in, it is never repeated. Um, um, and they only describe in, deta in any detail five of the cases. And in those five cases, four are in the operating room, which is the, m the most common place where resuscitation takes place. And one was a patient with the MI. Um, one of the interesting things um, that comes out later, um, in part, uh, I, I interviewed uh, Jude about this. Um, and also, he has a, a paper about sort of his personal experience. Blaylock, who was the chief of surgery at the time, was the mentor of, of this, uh, um, for this project, although he didn't have his name on the paper. And he, one of the things he insisted on was that they have good data. And good data mean that they have, um, that they have tracings on the patients to make sure they really had cardiac arrest. And so they were selecting for patients who were being monitored. And the people who are being monitored are the people who are undergoing procedures. So we see, a, um, it turns out, a bunch of people who are undergoing the uh, CAS, which were just uh, cardiac uh, catheterization, which had just uh, become um, available in the late 50s. Um, and so a bunch of the patients who died had that. Um, and it turns out that just about all the patients, except for that one guy who had the MI, um, had um, iatrogenic uh, complications as the cause of their cardiac arrest. But this was not mentioned at all in the paper. And it's, I don't think it's because they were hiding anything. I think it's because that was the, the style of the day in terms of uh, not really going into a lot of details on who they're, who, who they're doing the procedure on. It's really a different sort of standard for clinical care. So now all you need is two hands, and you can do this um, cardiac uh, massage. And so they take their, they, 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 this is the second paper in which they expand the number of people they're doing um, resuscitation on to, this is now 118 patients. And you can see, if you, I, I broke it down here on this graph, um, they're still having good success rate in the operating room. Um, and this is um, the operating on just surg um, cardiac surgeon, surgery. MI is always thought is a possible, um, you know, people who have primary cardiac disease, they thought, they thought that that would be the, the people who they would be most successful after the ones um, getting uh, surgery. And indeed, they have a 13% success rate. Then the miscellaneous, who they don't describe at all, um, they have a 7%. So it, it goes down substantially. So um, in the second paper, they, they actually are very aware of this notion of what is cardiac arrest? Who are we doing this on? Um, and, and in the paper, they, they, who, in which Jude is now the first author, the surgeon, um, this term once applied only to the sudden death associated with anesthesia and surgery. Um, they change it. Cardiac arrest is now the sudden and unexpected cessation from whatever cause of circulation producing cardiac activity. So it's, it it's opens it up. So very early on, though, we see that there's some disenchantment with this procedure, um, that the realization that CPR is ineffective in most cases um, is evident in 1962. I call that phase one. Phase two is the introduction of orders to sort of circumvent the therapy. So this is a, an interesting editorial that published in circulation, um, authored um, by uh, the American Heart Association, the Amer uh, National Red Cross, and the Industrial Medical Association. Um, and th at this time, they have enough experience to know that, quote, most people who experience a sudden stoppage of the heart, cardiac arrest, cannot be saved even under ideal circumstances in a hospital. And the next sentence actually gives a clue that cardiac massage has not yet become the default in the hospital because they say the least measure of success is in coronary heart attack cases. And this is the group that they thought would have the most success as compared with those um, in, you know, after those in the operating room. Um, because the people with the least success, obviously, would be those who were, you know, in the terminal conditions that they talk about. So they're probably not doing it on everybody. Um, interestingly, in, you know, they, they know that it's not working on most people. Instead of trying to sort of limit the indications, what they do 
um, is they propose limiting who can do the procedure. And so they, they say, we believe that emphasis should be placed at this time on training physicians, dentists, nurses, and specially qualified emergency rescue personnel. So they want to keep it a professional, they want to keep it in the profession because that's the way we control, we can control uh, too many people getting the procedure inappropriately. Um, so one of the things we, um, another sort of, um, that can be looked at as, um, as a response to the poor outcomes of, of uh, CPR in the wards is the development of actually the c cardiac care unit. And this is a, a paper by Yu Day who developed the first cardiac care unit actually in Kansas City. And he talked about their free, the three phases of, of their resuscitation program. The first phase um, obviously is in the operating room. The second phase is the management of cardiac arrest uh, occurring unexpectedly on the floors of the hospital. And so that it gives you the idea that they're only doing it on people who, who, who it happens unexpectedly, not those who are expected to die. But even in that, in the, in that case, they have a very poor success rate. He, in this paper, he talks about eight, uh, re, um, successfully resuscitating 8% of the people. And the reason he thinks that's going on is it's, it's well known for the, since you know, early in the um, open cardiac massage um, movement, it was well known that one of the biggest factors in, in um, predicting the success of resuscitation was uh, the time between the cardiac arrest and the beginning of therapy. And so decreasing that time by better monitoring was uh, seen as one way of imp improving uh, the outcomes. The other thing is being able to train nurses specifically to do cardiac resuscitation in, you know, very quickly. And so they created um, the first uh, cardiac care unit specifically um, to treat cardiac arrest in 1962. Um, and this took on, this became the standard of care very quickly. Most hospitals developed, it became, you know, standard to have a cardiac care unit starting in the early 1960s. Um, after a few years, though, people realized that this wasn't that helpful either, that even in the cardiac care unit, cardiac arrest was not um, treated very effectively. And this is a paper by uh, Bernard Lown, um, who set up a similar cardiac care unit um, at Beth Israel Hospital. And he talks about the focus of management in the cardiac care unit should be altered from resuscitation to the prevention of the need for resuscitation. And so we see here, um, a, a change in focus. At the same time, um, this is um, a paper by Sister Mary Fields, comes out in 1966, and she describes a CPR t uh, team in a medium-sized hospital, actually in Fargo, North Dakota. And we see here Sister Mary Fields uh, intubating a patient. She was a respiratory therapist. And sh she's very excited about this, this procedure, and she just talks about it as a right it's a right of patients, even in small hospitals in the middle of, you know, North Dakota, should patients have the right to this procedure. Um, and so this is sort of another movement, another force in the increasing application. Here we see another editorial, uh, very much, very similar to the one in 62. And the last line here, um, actually, this is, it's an editorial, but it's also, uh, it's the guidelines for doing CPR, which is where a lot of these editorials come from. Um, CPR is not indicated in a patient who is known to be in the terminal stages of an incurable condition. So we see here a very clear um, articulation that you shouldn't be doing it to everybody. At the same time, there's no mechanism uh, proposed for how to do this. And so what was actually happening in the hospitals in the 1960s is, is really, it's hard to know um, because there's hardly any literature, any medical literature about how people were dying in the hospital at this time. One, one piece of evidence that I was able to find is this letter which appears in the British Medical Journal and it's actually written by a Brit an English um, uh, pathologist, this guy William St. Clair Simmers. Um, who's the head of pathology at Shearing Cross Hospital. Um, and he describes the case in this letter. He describes the case of a story um, of a doctor, um, uh, age 68, who's found to have widely metastatic gastric cancer. Um, it's gone to his uh, liver and, uh, and uh, as well as his uh, spine. Um, and he actually asks, it's, it's, it's a really sad case, he asks that no further treatment be given. He says, I'm, you know, I'm in horrible, horrible pain, despite pain medicine, just don't 
do anything more to me. This is after, actually, they do an embolectomy on the ward um, when he has a pulmonary embolism. And he actually writes this in the medical record. And despite this request uh, in this letter, which apparently several doctors who were there told Simmers about this, um, he continues to read CPR on several occasions. Um, at, at one point, he's noted to be decerebrate, basically brain dead, but that hasn't occurred, you know, that hasn't been created as a condition yet. And even after that, they, they do a tracheostomy and they're planning to put him on a ventilator, um, but then his uh, heart finally stops and he's, uh, he's allowed, you can say, allowed to die. And so, um, you know, this gives you a sort of a picture of, of, of what was going on in the, in the 60s. Um, as CPR was becoming the default, but there was yet no mechanism for not doing it. So one of the mechanisms actually for not doing it in some patients comes out of this um, paper is in 1968, the same year, a few months later, um, by the uh, ad hoc committee uh, at Harvard who finally defined brain death. Um, and this is, you know, partly, um, most you know, obviously a response to people who can have their hearts continually to be restarted who are actually, um, whose brains are, are totally gone. And so this, we can stop doing CPR now if you have brain death. So that's uh, one, um, one way to, to, to not do the therapy. So another factor in the formation of the cardiac arrest paradigm that's really un underappreciated, I think, was the perfect storm of the infusion of billions of government dollars into medicine starting in 1966 with uh, Medicare. This is, co happens coincidentally with the broadening indications for CPR. Um, and perhaps the final force for the universal default application of CPR and the CPR project was the money to pay for it. Um, and the way that this was worked out was really ingenious, was done by the uh, American Medical Association, um, who created this current procedural terminology. Um, they, the first edition comes out in 1966, coincident with the starting of the funding. And in this, in this manual, they basically list all the billable procedures and their indications um, that, so that doctors can now bill Medicare, the government. Um, and when it first came out, it's a very thin book, mostly surgical procedures, but it increased by 70% um, for the second edition. And there were very few medical procedures, actually, at the time that were billable. But we can see here that cardiac resuscitation for cardiac arrest becomes a billable, um, a billable, billable procedure in 1970. Um, so, so CPT, the current procedural terminology, is, is an important part of the paradigm. Um, it fuels it um, by specifying what is a billable procedure and, and creating the mechanism for, for collecting fees for that. One of the things um, that it did as well was it, it created a new important agenda item for physicians. Um, and it's really evolved into an obsession with documenting um, uh, for billing that we live with now in that they specified the requirements, what needs to be reported, what information needs to be reported to justify uh, the charges. And so this became a very important part of, of physicians' uh, jobs in the paradigm. Um, and interestingly, patients were rewarded for, um, physicians are rewarded for patients being sicker. And so there was a lot of energy placed in, into documenting just how very sick the patients are. So, 1974 sees the, um, um, it, there's a, a, a large supplement. I showed you the cover before with all those old dioramas. This is a, a big supplement that comes out of JAMA uh, describing the latest techniques for CPR. But in it, we find a, a, a paragraph, again, another paragraph talking about um, that it's not indicated in certain situations, such as cases of terminal irreversible in, uh, illness where death is not unexpected. Or, and so this, this notion, again, it's very similar to the 1966 editorial, that it doesn't work in these people and it's not indicated. But finally, we have a mechanism. And so when CPR is considered to be contraindicated for hospital patients, it's appropriate to indicate this in the patient's progress notes. It's also appropriate to indicate this on the physician's order sheet for the benefit of nurses. And this is really key because nurses are the ones who are, who are 
diagnosing cardiac arrest on the wards, and they're the ones who are initiating CPR. And so we see that the first um, DNR order is really a communicative act between doctors telling nurses, don't do this. Um, and the other interesting part of this is there's absolutely no mention of patients being involved in the decision in 74. So, you know, DNR was only one of the, of the mechanisms that came, the people came up with for dealing with this default. Um, um, but other, other mechanisms that, that didn't become popular, but I think are very important historically, were also um, proposed. And this, um, this is an attempt uh, to navigate care um, once the default's in place that, that was put into uh, place in the ICU at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And what it is is a prognostic classification system. And what they want to do is help define overall therapeutic goals in critically ill patients. Um, and it, it's, I think it's really interesting here that so they need to explicitly articulate overall therapeutic goals because of their conspicuous absence in the onslaught of life-saving default therapies. Um, and the next line is also interesting. It's to force the conscious decision as to use or omission of heroic measures, including CPR. And so here we're talking, I mean, what they're saying is we're not making conscious decisions about how to treat our patients. We're doing this, this thing where we, where, where we um, treat them, um, we're treating everybody in the same way. Um, in the same year, 74, um, this is a very important case in this history. We see Karen Ann Quinlan um, ODs on uh, alcohol and, and pills, and she receives CPR from her friends here. Um, and uh, it, it's not, it, obviously it doesn't work that well. She becomes uh, vegetative, uh, and her family requests her to be taken off the ventilator, um, but they won't do it. And so they, they take it to the courts, and the Supreme Court in New Jersey um, finally um, supports um, the removal of life support from, uh, for, from Karen in 76. Um, and this is an amazing, amazing um, uh, event that happens, I think, that, that's um, not only because it's the first time that it's publicly sanctioned, but also it opens up the discourse about um, what's actually happening in hospitals. And we see this editorial in the New England Journal that comes out a few months later, terminating life support out of the closet, um, in which they, the hospitals finally come clean with what's, ag what's actually going on in the hospital. Um, and so uh, and they, this is a, a paper, this is along with this, what, what they report what's happening in Mass General, which is actually doing a very similar system to TAG in the ICU. Um, but also um, the other paper that's probably even more important is by Rapkin, in which he reports, um, in which he proposes um, that patients be the ones who decide whether or not they should be DNR, um, which was obviously um, um, a, a very big um, change in how this occurred. And this was slowly became the standard. Um, so we see that the, these sort of prognostic um, um, classifications don't really um, ca catch on that well, but what does catch on is this whole DNR uh, order, and, um, and that becomes sort of a surrogate for the classification system. Um, and so what we see here is, a, is an early paper written about DNR in, in the early uh, 80s, 1982, um, and he talks about um, instead of, ad because it had not become that popular, DNR was still, um, was not, you know, it was a pretty uncommon order at the time. And his, his proposal is that instead of making it a negative order, like don't do this, don't do resuscitation, they change it to a positive order, do comfort measures only. Um, and what we see here um, is that DNR is used as a drastic, um, it's used to a drastic change in what care should look like. Um, and it, the meaning is now, um, instead of doing everything, we provide comfort. Now this whole notion of using DNR in that way um, is, is further repeated the next year by Lowe and Steinbrook. He says, physicians have no obligation to provide futile or useless treatment. DNR is appropriate when further treatment is futile um, so that successful CPR would only prolong the process of dying. So 
DNR is appropriate at the moment when all other treatments are futile. But interestingly, in the same paper, um, Lowe and Steinberg say, but a DNR order means only that CPR will not be performed, which I, I think um, really shows their sort of lack of appreciation of a meaning, of what a meaning of, of DNR is, even in the, in the very paper that they're presenting at the time. And this confusion would continue. Um, and this is, um, in the 80s, people started realizing that less aggressive care, um, that DNR really was signaling um, not only um, for going CPR, but also set a, an agenda for, for less aggressive care. And there's a paper here by the group um, here at the McLean Center in 88. And this is uh, Brody um, and Tomlinson talk about it makes a big difference what's the motivating rationale for, for DNR, um, what, what it actually means, um, or what, what the people who are proposing um, it mean. And so this is a, obviously the cause of a lot of confusion that we still have today um, surrounding, especially as DNR becomes, people advocate doing it earlier and earlier. So the, um, the cardiac arrest paradigm um, profoundly altered the doctor-patient uh, relationship with sacrifices on both sides. Patient relinqu relinquished their control over their bodies for the potential of extended life, and physicians gave up their judgment about what was best for a particular patient at the moment of cardiac arrest. When the choice was finally given to patients, it became the, an important moment of patient autonomy as defined um, in the paradigm. In, an essence, in essence, what, what it is is a consent to participate or stay in the cardiac arrest experiment, which is to say that cardiac arrest for everyone whose heart stopped was a large-scale experiment. Um, physicians, when they make attempts to keep patients in or out of the experiment, but mostly be, um, because of the default, the, Physicians are very motivated to get patients out of it, um, motivated by the knowledge that it would not help. Um, when, when physicians do that in this system, they're, they're seen as uh, being paternalistic, um, in part because defining um, the way we define cardiac arrest, as I talked about in the beginning, is not really about eff efficacy, but really about expectations. So. Another aspect of the doctor-patient relationship that was profoundly altered by this was the, the claim inherent in, in the default application of CPR is the claim that we really have a life-saving therapy. And this really created a new responsibility um, for the life of the patient um, that I think doctors took on in the 60s and 70s and, and continues today. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we see um, when the, with the failure uh, to meet this uh, claim, we see the birth of the medical malpractice industry during this time with uh, claims increasing drastically from the 50s um, to the 80s, 10 times, the tenfold increase. So um, I've tried to give you sort of a whirlwind introduction to the paradigm. And the question then is, um, how do we move beyond this paradigm? I think for the first step really is appreciating um, when we're in it, what, what it what, how it's informing care today. And I think one of the, re, one of the ways to, to work to get beyond it is more truthful telling of the limits of medicine in the 21st century. Um, you know, even though most hospitals are among the top 100s, um, all over the country, if you, you see their signage. Um, you know, I think we need to get a, a level of truth-telling that we really have, have not been doing up until now. So I think, you know, when doctors talking to patients, they, got, they need to present real therapeutic options, not everything that's possibly indicated or billable. And I think this is one way of regaining trust, which in, 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 very, in, in a lot of ways was lost in the paradigm. I think what we need is a more careful telling of what is happening in the present and less about sort of advanced directives, which people are obsessing about. Um, so care in the present, um, which de-emphasizes code status. I think, you know, people are obsessed with, you know, whether or not we're going to do resuscitation at the end of your life. It's, it's obviously not a big issue because the, the therapy doesn't work that great unless you have something iatrogenic. And you're not going to know if some, that's going to happen unless it happens. 
Um, though it's fine for people not to want it. I'm not pushing resuscitation on everyone. I'm just saying I don't want to be DNR. Um, so we need to de-emphasize code status. Um, you know, pe people need to pick a surrogate for when they can't make decisions. That's not such a big deal and, uh, as we make it. I think the reason it's a big deal now is we tie it to code status. Once we separate that, I don't think it'll be a big deal. And I think the other part is, is you know, um, Pellegrino, Edward Pellegrino, uh, Dan Macy's mentor, talked about virtues, though um, the way I see them happening, um, going back to Hippocrates here, is the notion of, you know, as physicians, what, what are our goals really? We want to alleviate suffering, we want to reduce the severity of illness, and we want to recognize treatable from untreatable diseases. And, you know, to bring this to the 21st century, we need to do that uh, and tell patients, this is what we can do, and this is what, you know, we, we, we can treat. And, and to be honest about that. And if we followed these goals, I think, you know, that would radically alter the practice of medicine today. Thank you. Mark had to leave uh, for Mexico, so um, questions? Um, Dan, you showed um, a 1962 article, I think, in which there was the recommendation that resources for CPR training be devoted to physicians and nurses, and you characterized that as trying to keep control um, and make it professional. Um, but the, the, the wording that was there, which, which fits more with my impression, <clears throat> is that it was a matter of where do you devote the initial resources for training? You've got like two million people between doctors and nurses um, who were essentially untrained at that point and who would need to be trained in this procedure, and that's a substantial challenge. No, no. And if, if, you devote, if you devote resources you know, to them first, yeah. it seems to only make sense. No, this was not a resource issue. This was who, who should be allowed to perform the procedure. So this was a thing that the, uh, uh, the Red Cross had a bunch of people who, who were waiting to be lay people who, who were willing to throw big bucks into this. Um, and the, the question is, who should be allowed to do the procedure? And this was a clear move to make it a medical procedure and not a procedure for lay people. Um, let me go back. It's fine. But, um, and so in the 66 editorial that I showed, they reversed that. And they said, now it's, you know, we're, we're going to train lay people as well. It's, uh, they changed it from a medical procedure to an emergency procedure. And, and so th they were able to start training lay people as well because there was a tremendous groundswell. People really wanted to learn how to do this. Um, and this was, I, I see this not as a ma matter of, you know, limited resources, but as a matter of control of who, sh who should get to perform CPR. Thanks, Dan. That was a, a most amazing uh, tour to the development of uh, everything up to now. And, um, uh, just a couple of comments and then just a question. Talk, can you put a couple of comments and then a question of um, your opinion. I'm, I'm struck with how there's a, such a direct parallel now in the, di in the discussion about who is allowed to perform the procedure. Uh -huh. Only now the procedure is the conversation. The conversation, yes. And there's that same argument over right. whether that conversation should be restricted to the doctors and the nurses versus whether it should um, be... Uh, expanded and who can be taught and who's qualified. Um, my question to you is, um, uh, I hope this isn't all that rhetorical, but what are the elements in the telling of the story of what's happening now? How long would that typically take for somebody who has a chronic, progressive, ultimately fatal, but right now stable condition? Um, and, and uh, if, it's a, if that conversation takes a long time, who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it? Well, I think we could have this conversation once, you know, put it on television. You know, this is, this is the truth about this procedure. You don't need to have it individually with people. You know, not getting resuscitation at the end. And, I mean, you're talking about the, the goals of care conversation. Which yeah, conversation are you yeah. talking about? What, Maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. Yeah. To me, the what's happening now has to do with 
you know, your that's, no, that's how No, that's how a doctor should be interacting with their patients all the time. Yep. I mean, this is, this is what's going on right now. This is what we're going to do about that. That's doctor-patient interaction. It's not about, you know, it's not about all this other stuff. I think the, the whole notion of the goals of care conversation and, and, and sort of creating that as a billable, as a billable procedure, I think is really ironic in, in the face of the paradigm, you know? They, they got CPR to be billable and now they say, well, it doesn't work, so we're gonna create a conversation now so you don't have to do it. I think doing it is ridiculous, you know, uh, when it's obviously not gonna work. And I think physicians need to take a stand and say, I'm not doing it, you know? It's not, I'm not doing this thing, you know? It's, it's a matter of, um, you know, and so then you wouldn't have to get people to sign this thing and say, I'm giving up you know, all this stuff because I want to be DNR. You know, I think DNR creates, and the whole notion of the goals of care, which, you know, the language going back to the 1974 really shows that it, it was, a, it was a, a bomb for the, you know, a, a SEV for this, this default application of therapies. What I'm talking about is not doing any therapies default. I'm talking about doing therapies that are indicated at a given moment, not because they're on a list of things that tells us what to do now. And that's, you know, that's a radical notion. I understand that. But, you know, the, the, the goals of care conversation, I think, is, you know, when, when patient, it's, it's that's, that's such Orwellian language, you know, what we mean by the goals of care conversation. We're still trying to make it like a choice for patients. What are your goals of care here? What we're really telling the patient is, we got nothing left that's going to make you better, but we can make you comfortable, which is a fine thing, but it has nothing to do with the goals of care. It has to do with, you know, we got nothing left and we can make you comfortable. There's no choice involved. We can, you know, beat the heck out of you too if you want that and we'll do that in the paradigm. Um, I won't, but a lot of physicians will. Yeah. Uh, Dan, could you expand on that a little bit? I think we know where you stand on it. Uh, it was fairly clear. Um, um, do you think that part of the conversation that doesn't, does or does not happen ought to begin with the um, telling of the tale to patient and family that you're dying and just say that for that purpose. Now, you're, say, you're saying that you know, you're emptying it, but I think that there is a part of our um, conversation uh, that we have with patients over time that has prevented us from saying things like that. Well, and, and I think that if we start that conversation by saying you're actually dying, there is no more to do, that I think that conversation can be very short. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a short conversation. But the thing of it is, is that, you know, in some ways we're all dying, right? It's just a matter of time, right? I think the, the really big push for, for getting, telling people that they were dying was that we don't want to have to do resuscitation on you when you die. That was one of the big impetuses for those conversations because we're going to have to beat the, the heck out of you if you die in the hospital without this order. And so that, that was a very compelling reason to, to make sure people knew that. You know, and I think people need to know that, you know, given an idea of their prognosis, I am all for that, you know. To the extent we can do that, we know we're not that great at doing it. I think what's important is the people to know what we can offer them and what we can't, you know? That's what's important, you know, what therapies we have, not the exact time you're going to die, you know? And, and I think telling people, you know, they're going to die, you know, it's obvious, I'm going to die, you know? Um, and you're not, I, I think, you know, after a while, it's really obvious, not such a great service we're doing by telling them. It's a great service when we free them from the, the brutality of the things we're going to do to them. But that brutality shouldn't be happening in the first place, right? And so we've created this system in which we need to do all this stuff to circumvent these defaults that we put into place because of those forces. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the default is a rigid practice. Somewhat? Uh, it's a, uh, from my experience as a resident, I'm an internal medicine resident right now. What, how many minutes have you been practicing? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Ha! Ha! I'm just kidding you. Uh, <laughs> it seems like the reason it's a default is a practical one. What's the practical reason? Iatrogenesis is one of the few 
times that we can actually get someone back with CPR as you right. out. Iatrogenic things happen unexpectedly all the time in the hospital. And expectedly. And expectedly. We know when we yeah, do something sure. iatrogenically, but, right? You know, and if something is unexpected, the only reason that the person would get CPR in that scenario is if it was the default. So I guess from that very practical level, do you have a response to it? Right. That? So if you were in a situation where a patient has had an iatrogenic complication and they go into cardiac arrest, unless, you know, they, they, if people knew that they were going to resuscitate, resuscitate it because we thought it could actually help them, you know, at those moments, then they wouldn't want to be DNR, or some people wouldn't. Some people would still want to not get resuscitation, and those people should not get it, you know? That's fine, but it's the people who are still into the medical, you know, they're pushing to get better or to at least, to get better, to uh, at least somewhat better, they're still into that, then they would be open to be, get CPR if we knew that we could have some chance of reversing it i.e. that it was an iatrogenic event. And so being open to that, I think, is fine. Doesn't mean we have to do it in people who are obviously dying. And at the moment you see someone's dying, you can see it's not iatrogenic anymore. This person is dying here, you know? We don't need to do CPR now, right? You know when that happens, right? And that's when you try so hard to get your DNR order. Yeah. A gazillion. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, it really depends who they do it on, you know. If 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 they do it on people that the really iatrogenic complications, um, you know, if we give you too much potassium and you go into V fib, you know, we can bring you back with you know 95 percent success rate, right? But if you're, you know, at the end of a terminal illness from metastatic cancer, the, the rate is zero. So it's, there's a big variation. And that's part of the problem with it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. An internal, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, I think the, 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 the fear of, um, of legal ramifications, I think, is, is one of the, uh, that's a great question, whoa. The fear of legal ram the ramifications of not doing CPR, I think, are, are one of the reasons that, that keep it going the way it is. What, what is it doing? It's opening, yeah. Um, I actually had a slide, you know, I have way too many slides. I didn't talk about a lot of things um, that I could have um, because, this is work that I've been doing for a long time. Um, but here we see, this is by a lawyer in 1968. Um, and he, he's talking about, um, he's talking about um, the notion of setting, a st setting standards of care. Um, so with these theoretical distinctions in mind, we may turn to analysis of specific aspects of medical decision not to prolong life. The first problem is to isolate the rele relevant medical activity. The recurrent pattern inclu includes stopping cardiac resuscitation. Oh, this is actually not the slide I want. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, sorry. Anyway, so in a, it, later on this paper, Fletcher says, we, you, doctors have a chance now to set standards and set expectations for patients of what they should expect in the hospital. And this is 68 before the default. And he said, you shouldn't let the courts decide this. You guys should do this. You should set the standards of when you're going to apply the therapy or not. And um, obviously, doctors didn't do that. Um, they, they left it 
they, they, I, I see it as sort of an, a little bit of an abdication. Nobody step forward and say, These are the, this is where we're going to do CPR, this is where we're not going to do CPR. And if they had set those standards of care, then I, I think they would have created the expectations. You know, he talks about creating expectations of patients when they're going to receive it. What, what happened was, because it became the default, everybody expected to get it, and everybody expected to live forever, because you have the cure for death. And I think, you know, physicians, you know, I think they, they really benefited substantially from that claim, you know. Not, I don't think doctors were doing CPR because they were getting, you know, billing for it, but I think that there were moves to, to make CPR the default by administrators, and people who are into the business of medicine that said, this is a really lucrative thing. We should be doing this a lot. And, you know, and I think that's part of this whole paradigm. And the fact that met, you know, all this money came into the, 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 the medicine at that time is another impetus for the whole malpractice you know, industry that exists now. Yes? Have there ever been malpractice charges for inappropriate CPR? Uh, inappropriate, you mean if people had DNRs and you had CPR? Or, well that, or a little more broadly, people who shouldn't have gotten CPR, even if they weren't technically DNR. Who would bring, if they were not DNR? No, that's a standard of care, it's to do CPR, you can't get sued for that. Yeah. All right. What? If they were DNR, there are cases where people sued and I think successfully sued because they were still alive because they got resuscitated, yeah. Yeah, you see um, the external defibrillators in airports and on trains and all over the place. Are they effective or are they, does it make sense to expend resources on such things? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think the, the, the I'm not an expert on those, and I think the word is still out. I think the possibility is there that if you do have, you know, there are people who have purely electrical deaths. And it doesn't happen very often, but if it does happen, you know, an airport is where a lot of people walk through a high stress environment. It's possible if you have an electric death, if you get defibrillated right away, that you could survive. So I think the potential is there. I don't think it's hurting anybody um, the way all this other stuff is. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine with those even though I don't, I don't think they've been that successful yet. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs>